Welcome to Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now you can learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property. Learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau with the Mineola Law Firm of Shane Doxtanisi and Corker. He's a member of the Committee on Professional Ethics of the Bar Association of Nassau County and counsel to the Nassau Academy of Law. And now, here is your host for Law You Should Know, Attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today our topic is divorce without destruction, and it's going to cover a different approach to divorce and potentially different and better results for the parties involved. And our special guest is attorney Chaim Steinberger, and he's a divorce attorney, but he has a different approach to practicing divorce. And and we'll t- find out more about that in the next few minutes. He also is a lecturer and lectures professional groups and mental health professionals and other organizations about following this different approach to divorce and giving them background concerning divorce-related issues. Hi, and welcome to Law You Should Know. It's my pleasure to be with you, Kenneth. Thank you. And I know you've recently published an article in the New York Law Journal on divorce without destruction. To tell us about why you chose that topic. Well, too many people don't think that there's a choice. They think there's only one way to fight. And what's really amazing, I mean, it's understandable, that when people call a lawyer such as me or somebody else, by necessity they had to have come to the conclusion that the other party is completely unreasonable. Because every person has to believe that they are reasonable. So if I have a disagreement with you, Ken, then... As long as I believe that you're reasonable, I'm like, okay, we're going to work this out. We're two reasonable people that have a dispute. We'll work it out. When I figure out that we can't work it out without the help of a lawyer, it must be because I've come to the conclusion that you're unreasonable and that you can't be negotiated with. And so 100% of the people that call me up when I say there are six different dispute resolution processes, and let's talk about which process is right for you in this situation. How do we get you to where you want to be with a minimum of aggravation, of cost, of expense? Every one of them says, when I get to, when I get to mediation, they say, oh, that person, you can't negotiate with that person. And my response is always, you're absolutely right. If you keep doing what you've been doing, then you'll keep getting the same result you've been getting. Mediators, now, just just to be clear, I am a mediator. I do a lot of mediation. Even when I arbitrate, I tend to resolve disputes. Even when I litigate, I use my mediation training to resolve disputes. And so these mediator techniques can be used by every litigator to resolve disputes. In fact, I wrote an article for the New York County Lawyers Association called mediator techniques that every litigator can use. And, and sometimes, and is, yes, sometimes judges, too, also use, or their staffs use mediation techniques to resolve uh, litigation, because it's much more efficient, and both, it's, it re, the, you'll, I'm sure you'll mention later on, the resolution is something both parties can live with. I was going to say the the fairness I, it, the fairness concept you mentioned is, could be a reason why people are getting divorced. They don't think the other person is is fair, or you know they can't resolve any issues in their marriage with them. And the more threatened the person feels, the more they get tunnel vision, and the less able they are to see different disputes, uh, different resolutions. So when people get to us. They're locked in. Every client who comes to you, can they, they're locked into the position that they feel in order for me to win, the other side has to lose. And that's a false premise. There is, using the Harvard Negotiation Project and the book by Fisher and Uri getting to yes, this idea that two people can both win. And 
when once people sit down, and I've had this, I've had people come to me who've been fighting three, four, five years. They've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on legal fees, and in four hours they're shaking hands and walking out. This is when two people come. There's a magical moment in mediation when people stop being adversaries and they start and they realize we have a problem. How do we resolve this problem? And they start working together. And what allows that to happen? Is it an outside facilitator such as yourself if they focus on achieving their wins but without necessarily destroying the other person? So I would say that the first ingredient that we need is safety. Because so long as people feel threatened, so if my client feels threatened, my client can't hear any other solutions. If a, the opposing party feels threatened, they can't hear any solutions. So this technique that I'm advocating, divorce without destruction, and just to be clear, too many people, I'm always very self-conscious because I'm afraid that people think divorce without destruction or mediation means, okay, walk away with less than you're entitled to, just don't rock the boat and don't make... And, and that's not at all what I'm ascribing to. What I'm saying is you can get more. You can get a better result by using these techniques. And the way that happens is by treating. So first of all, I have to give my client the safety and security. My clients know that I would walk through fire and water for them. And so I then have the credibility to be able to sit down with my clients and say, okay, let's figure out how do, we, how do we present your case in a way that makes it very compelling? How do we create a theory of the case? How are we going to present this to the judge? Once my client has that safety to know that they're not being... I, I had somebody call me up and say, what is the biggest problem that men have in the divorce process? And, and my answer surprised, and this was a, a, a divorce coach, uh, and, and particularly servicing men through divorce. And I said, the biggest problem men have is that their lawyers don't listen to them. And so they walk into court, they know the lawyer hasn't really understood their case, and then they see their lawyers performing, and they know the lawyer doesn't get it, and so how is the judge ever going to get it? And that, that's such a great frustration, that's when you need the three court officers standing behind the party to make sure that he doesn't act out. But that all stems from frustration because the party thinks that he's not being heard. But, so, but and, and also just many lawyers um, have a one-track mind too, and that tunnel vision you mentioned earlier that some of their clients have, that they're focused on litigation and more litigation and still more litigation and those bills start to add up. And, uh, of course, clients may be happier following some of your ideas because there's a bigger plot pie to split up to keep you know, both clients happy. So, absolutely. The first line in my article is, diehard litigators who have only one tool in their toolbox often believe that the only way to achieve the best results is to be as gr- aggressive and confrontational as possible. And, and sometimes, so, as you mentioned earlier, clients go into the lawyer with that mindset, and the lawyer fuels that mindset. You know, one more round, a, another deposition, a, another expert, another motion, and we'll get to, you know, we haven't won the battle, but we'll win the war, and it becomes a war. Well, sometimes you need that. So I'm hesitant to make these blanket statements because sometimes you do need to take that extra deposition. Sometimes you do need to make sure that you button down. There was an article in the New York Law Journal a while back that said those cases that prepare for mediation, no, those cases that prepare for trial settle at mediation. Those cases that prepare for mediation have to go to trial. So I ascribe to the philosophy of Sun Tzu, the great Chinese warrior who wrote The Art of War, who says that if you're a true pacifist, you will be schooled in all of the martial arts so that when you walk down the street, nobody would dare hurt you or your, or your loved ones. The, I d- I, go ahead. The way of getting... The, getting a good result is by knowing the client's case, by preparing a good case, by walking into a settlement conference or a mediation session or just 
or just a conference with another lawyer and client and saying, here's what I've got. Here's what I'm going to prove at trial. You want to go to trial or can we settle this here? If, if it's sort of the difference between a good lawyer and a great lawyer, the good lawyer takes your case to court and wins it. The great lawyer convinces the other side why they have a lost case so that they settle the case without ever going to trial. So in mediation, but, is, is that what's going to happen? When you solve that um, lengthy dispute in four hours, is that what takes place? Or each person finds out they can win and gain what they wanted without the other person losing what was important to them? So it's a combination of things. So the first step is that the client has to be has to feel safe so that they can broaden their horizon, that they can expand the, the possibilities of how to settle this. And then we do the same thing to the other side, so that when I go into a conference, you treat the other side with dignity, with respect, you listen to them, you, um, you empathize with their position, you agree with as much as you can agree. I went into negotiation session where... I was talking, opposing counsel cut me off and started talking, and the other client picked up his hand, put it in front of his lawyer's face, and said, stop, I want to hear what Chaim has to say. Now, I would never let my client do that, but this is the idea of he knew I was treating him fairly and decently, and he knew that I wasn't snowing him, and he, he genuinely wanted to say. So that changes the dynamic, and now we set up a dynamic where people can hear and be heard in a safe space. Once you do that, then people can now start to figure out. So I might look at a woman and say, okay, Mrs. Smith, I understand that this house is really important to you. Can you help me understand why is the house really important, to you, so important to you? And she might say, well, little Jimmy has ADHD, and the school has a great, has a great uh, program for that. And so, okay, so now we're not... It's not the house that she needs as a school district, or it might not be the house that may be close to her mother or close to her friends. And that expands the possibilities, not always, but now all of a sudden we can now start thinking about other things. And we're going to continue the process in a moment, and also I'd like to you to educate everyone on this, why it's important for lawyers to have that mindset and that approach to resolving disputes, as you suggest, in a in a coarse, effective way, without you know, with less destruction or no destruction, we're going to take a short break now. You're listening to "Divorce Without Destruction." Our guest is Chaim Steinberger. He's a lawyer in Manhattan and also a mediator, and he follows a collaborative law model at least some of the time. And you're listening to ninety point three WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College and also over the internet at nccradio.org. We'll be back in a moment. This program is brought to you by Nassau Community College, which offers a paralegal studies program. Students can major in paralegal studies while earning their associate's degree or earn a paralegal certificate if they already have a college degree. These programs can even help you start a second career as a paralegal. It's a program for anyone who wants to work in a law office assisting lawyers, the government, or a position in an insurance company. More information about full-time, part-time, days, evenings, weekends, or online courses is available by calling 516 516- 572-7774 or by email at paralegal at ncc.edu Once again, we continue with Law You Should Know from the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Dox, Denise, Corker, and Sauer here is attorney Kenneth J. Landau Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome back to Law You Should Know. We're talking with Chaim Steinberger, and he's the uh, an attorney, and he recently wrote an article for the New York Law Journal about divorce without destruction, and it's about an alternative approach and a, a better approach in many situations for resolving uh, divorce. Chaim, I just wanted to go back one step. Sometimes a spouse is looking for blood or vengeance or uh, feels that they got a raw deal from their spouse during the marriage and now's their time to get even. How can you bring that type of person on board? 
by helping them heal, by getting to the bottom of it. Now, this is what's really funny about what I do. I can't sell this. That's not where I'm licensed. That's not where I'm, 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 I'm credentialed in. But the thing that I'm most proud of, of what I do is I start to see patterns. I'm like, okay, what was it that happened? What did you do to set, to set this up? So I now got my client to realize that because of the way a grandparent treated a parent is why this client married somebody that was wrong for them. Or one woman's bad decision ruined three generations of family. Look, I'm a big believer in taking responsibility for our lives. And, and just to be very clear, there's a sophisticated concept of separating blame from responsibility. So even though I didn't do anything wrong and I'm not to blame, I can still take responsibility. For example, in every interaction I have with somebody else, I have to take responsibility for my side of the conversation. If, the, if, if you got up and walked away from me, then I have to think about what did I do to provoke your response. And, and it's a different way of looking at things. Whereas my ex-wife likes to say, honey, I didn't say it was your fault. I said I was blaming you. So we can separate blame from responsibility. And this idea of every person c contributed to, the, to, to the, the state of the relationship that it is in. And like an onion, we could keep peeling back. What did the spouse do? Okay, the spouse did that. What did you do to provoke your spouse from doing for, to do that? What did your spouse do that provoked you to do what you did that they did? And we can keep going back and forth. And at some point, the people realize, wait a second, you know what? So I'm a biggest subscriber to Dale Carnegie's sort of life wisdom, how to win friends and influence people. Every person takes what they believe is the only course of action available to them. So there comes a point where you say, okay, I guess I can see because of the way my spouse's father or mother treated them, they reacted to what I did in such a way they couldn't help themselves. How do we move on? Now, even if people are getting divorced and they have children, their relationship is going to affect their children not only until the age of child support, which is 21 in New York, but the next 30 or 40 years. I've had people who the children are 30 years old and they're trying to figure out, do we go to mom's for Thanksgiving or dad's? They both schedule it at the same time. And if we go to mom, dad gets angry. If we go to dad, mom gets angry. The biggest gift I often tell, ask clients, do you love your children more than you hate your ex? And the biggest gift we can give our children is the freedom to love the other parent. I don't know if you know this, but I've done a lot of work on parental alienation. Parental alienation is when one parent turns the children against another parent, and I've published on this issue. So this idea of what do we do, how do we help you heal, and, and maybe I, I've done a mediation. The court sent a, a couple that was divorcing, and they were at each other's throat. The court sent them to me, and the wife says he's now marrying the woman that he cheated on me with. And she was really upset. And I look at him and I say, would you like to say anything to that? And he looks at her genuinely and he goes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm causing you so much pain. I didn't mean to cause you so much pain. And then, of course, he launches in, but it was your fault because you did. And I'm like, no, 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 let's, let's, let's just leave it there. And just her hearing him say, I'm sorry that you're pained by what I'm doing, gave her a sense of healing. And that's magical. Okay, I noticed some other important points you want to cover. And of course, as you mentioned, it's important not to drag the children through the divorce or post-divorce process. And even if there's no children, there might be relatives or friends that so you be, uh, yeah, have to deal just, with. Just, yeah. to, just to be clear about children, studies show that parents who hate each other and stay together children can recover from that. Studies show that parents who divorce, who get divorced, children can recover from that. The one thing children can never, reco never 
recover from is a long, nasty, drawn-out battle. The longer the battle, the more nasty it is, the, the more dire the effect on the children. And 50 years later, they're still, the children are, are still maladapted. And so the, the question really becomes, we all love our children. And this idea, so, so whether it's my client or the other client, I want them both to heal because having them go out onto the thing, even when they move on, if they're still angry at each other, if they're still bearing the ill will, it's going to come out. It's going to affect them. It's going to ruin them. What did somebody say? Holding on to a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. And aside from the divorce, it's going to be healthier for both of them if they move on. I just exactly. want, and, and I just want to spend a few minutes talking about resolving these issues because we have a limited amount of time in the program. In your article, you mentioned the example of the orange, and how does talking the analogy of the orange help people to resolve, bring themselves to a win-win situation? So the, the story with an orange is, is a paradigm story. Two people fighting over an orange. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. And finally, one of them grows impatient, pulls out a knife, cuts the orange in half, walks away with his half of the orange, peels the orange, throws away the peel and eats the fruit. The other party peels the orange, throws away the fruit, and uses the peel to bake a cake. And we all slap our heads and go, if only somebody would have thought to stop them and say, what do you need the orange for? You could have had the whole orange, and you could have had the whole orange. So frequently, people are not... The, the, the dispute, the way it comes to us, it looks like they're diametrically opposite. But very often they're not. Everybody has what they want. A father typically is afraid he'll be cut out of the children's lives. A mother's afraid for her financial security. She wants to make sure her children are taken care of. If there's a way to assure each one of what's most important to them, they can then figure out a way to deal with the other issues, and, and they can feel better about it. Studies show, as I think you've alluded to earlier, Kenneth, is that if parties reach an agreement, they're most, more likely to abide by it. They do so happily. When one of them writes a check to the other one, they're not gritting their teeth every month, but they do it with grace and aplomb. They're less likely to come back to court and seek a modification. And more importantly, they can work together on other issues. So if they have children, they've got to make decisions about which schools to attend, which college to go, whether it's a bar mitzvah or a wedding, and how do we navigate all of this? And I know you, I know you have a lot of information, but, but also, on the other hand, in a traditional model, they both parties may be unhappy with the way a judge rules after great time and expense to get there. And there may constantly be renewed battles about some of the things you mentioned. Absolutely. So when parties are unhappy, they look for every loophole and they look for every excuse to go back to court. If one side feels that they were interred, and, and very often judges, judges do the best they can and they, they listen as best they can, and they make the best decisions they know how. But ultimately, people themselves can decide better. If you have a dispute with somebody in your life, you the two of you can figure out a better result than any judge can. If you, if you focus on that. And also, judges may have different criteria. They're, they're following the law and basing their decision on the facts as they see them. Their model is different than your model. So for, as an we, example, we just have like what, two minutes left in the show. Give us, just give us your example and then tell us why your approach is different than many other matrimonial lawyers. The law in New York is that if two people can't agree on having joint custody, then a court cannot order joint custody. And so all one party has to say is I can't get along with the other one. And now the court, the court has to decide which parent gets custody. So, so they're better. The reason... I not only protect and defend my clients, but I also empower them. I've had clients go out to their friends and say, he's going to change your life. Not only because of a lawsuit, yeah, he'll take care of you. Yes, he'll protect you. But it's more profound than that. It's giving you insight into why you got to where you got. The reason I do the work that I do, I went to law school later in life. I worked at some of the large law firms, Schulte, Roth, Morgan, Lewis. I clerked for a federal judge. During this period of time, I went through my own rather nasty divorce 
And I said, there's got to be a better way. So I now practice that better way. And, and my clients are happy for it. When I get a letter from somebody saying, Chaim, you gave my daughter back her childhood. When I get a, 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 a when I get a note from a woman I've never met in England that said thank you thank you thank you because of the care and the and dedication the care that you that you gave my my child I always knew I had a granddaughter out there I didn't think I'd ever get to see her I just spent the weekend. Okay. With I also in your example about the uh, custody it may also be true for the house if it's not economically feasible the judge may sell you know, maybe force both parties out of the house, but through an agreement, you might be able to work out something where one party can remain in the house or both parties share the house at different times. Anything's parties possible anything with an agreement. I'm sorry? Exactly, exactly. Parties can agree to anything they want. Judge has limited remedies available to her. Okay, and do you have more information about some of these concepts and ideas on your website? I do. Okay, can w- you give us... W- TheNewYorkDivorceLawyers.com, the that's spelled out, all spelled out, T-H-E-N-E-W, TheNewYorkDivorceLawyers.com. And lawyers is in the plural. Yes. Okay, and you have information about all these concepts and more information about your background. And we just can give you 30 other seconds, 30 more seconds, anything else you'd like to offer the public? I am happy to speak to anybody. If somebody has a problem or an issue and they'd like to know how to handle it, um, they can call me and I will do whatever I can. Uh, This is my life's work. I live and die with every client and I love taking care of people. So aside from resolving the legal matter, you're trying to lead them on a much better path for the present and for the future and to accomplish that without destruction of their own position and the other person as well. Yes, they both get a better result. They're both happier when they walk out. Because they're also not angry about the process. Exactly. And as you said, some even if a person won on paper, they may not be happy with the process. And if they lost on paper, they're certainly not going to be happy with the process. Or if they think they lost. Absolutely. Okay, I'd like to thank our guest, Chaim Steinberger, for being our guest today on Laws You Should Know. Keep in mind, whatever you've heard is presented as information only, and you should get divorce advice or information about this from your own attorney, but feel free to look at his website or contact him for further information. If you missed any portion of the show or you want to mention it to other people, the podcast is available for free by searching WHPC on iTunes or Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com. Please join us next week for another program on Law You Should Know, the voice of NASA Community College here on 90.3 WHPC or over the internet at nccradio.org.